Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, to this webinar talk on archives and transitional justice, which is going to focus particularly on the Chilean case. I'm Dr. Anita Ferrara. I teach uh, human rights at the Irish Center for Human Rights and School of Law at NUI Galway. Welcome um, to join this webinar. I'll start by uh, giving a few concepts on the transitional justice and archives and why we do talk about the relationship between transitional justice and archives. For those of you that are not uh, familiar with the concept of transitional justice, so, and then I'll give a definition of archives, but I will start with the transitional justice one. It's, uh, deal, it deals with the way states and society, so processes, mechanisms, institutions, that states and societies choose to address a legacy of massive human rights violations after authoritarian regimes or conflicts in order to transition to um, democracy or to peace. The mechanisms of transitional justice include, but are not limited to, uh, truth commissions, trials, amnesties, reconciliation mechanisms, reparations, memorialization initiatives. Each society uh, decides what's the best way uh, to come to terms with its own past of mass atrocities. And I'm talking of the use of archives in this particular situation when countries are transitioning because archives play a vital and fundamental role in helping countries and societies transitioning to a more liberal democratic system or to a more peaceful uh, system. So archives play a, 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 an egregious role in this sense for many reasons. When we talk about archives and transitional justice, we have mainly scholars and practitioners have written in the last two decades quite a lot about the use of archives in transition. And we mainly talk about three types of archives. Archives of, um, that they have a role in transitions are usually archives documenting, obviously, the um, gross human rights violations committed in the past. And we're mainly talking of archives of repressive agencies, such as secret agencies, archives, military, armed forces, police archives, state archives. Or we talk about archives of civil society organizations. So archives created documents, records, created by those opposing the dictatorship and the authoritarian regime, such as human rights organizations, uh, civil society, relatives, um, and families and vic of the victims of human rights organizations, such as the um, organizations created by the relatives of those who've been detained and then may disappear. Prisoners, uh, political prisoners, uh, torture victims that have survived and uh, actually constituted themselves into organizations who started to document the evidence of the crimes that were committed under the past uh, regimes. And a last group of archives includes the archives left behind by truth commission, uh, truth commission, sorry, temporary hybrid tribunal, especially created to prosecute past crimes or memory science archives, which is today uh, quite a lot uh, theme of a huge debate. So these three sets of archives, which have been more or less defined in literature as the main chunks of archives called human rights archives, they are put under a general umbrella. And in my article, um, I actually written, uh, published last year in July with the Human Rights Review, I actually make a difference between, I say that we need to make a more distinctions between these groups of archives, particularly if we talk about, for example, human rights organizations, archives, civil society organizations, archives, and uh, truth commissions, archives, or um, transitional justice archives that I define them as transitional justice because they are, they are created uh, in a different time, uh, because they, have, they are owned by different institutions, and these as a lot of repercussions in terms of users preservation management in the future. So I think that more of a distinction should be made about the different uh, sets of archives. The literature has quite a lot extensively demonstrated and the practice as well, how these archives have so much contributed to countries in transition in two ways, mainly to protect human rights 
how. In order for truth commissions, trials, uh, and reparations to take place, uh, we need evidence. And this evidence is contained in these archives, these sets of archives that I've just uh, shown you. So these archives, the most of the literature has dedicated itself to how they are used and they have been used in the past 20 years to promote human rights because they play a fundamental role in unearthing the truth, provide evidence in trials, to claim reparations. And this means not just, uh, this means that the, this evidence is critical to the realization of the right to truth, the right to justice, and the right to reparation, increasingly recognized as fundamental rights of victims and relatives of human rights violations after mass atrocities. So they have a strong human rights protection views, this type of archives. And of course, they're also vehicles of collective memory. The relationship between archive and memory has been investigated and researched for quite a long time, uh, but in countries in transitions, archives acquire a special role in this particularly moment of transformation of countries' life, moment of crit critical importance in nations' life when, when narrative are transformed, rebuilt, uh, when these documents can strongly contribute to avoid revisions in the future. So they're particularly critical in this, uh, um, in this particular moment of a uh, country's life. They have become uh, memory spaces themselves, as some scholars have actually defined them. Pier Nora has defined archives occupying a preeminent role amongst various places of memory. Archives contribute to the open-ended process of memory creation around the recent past, and they are ideally situated amongst objects, artifacts that provide spaces for contesting the past through dynamic and infinite interoperations. Um, other scholars have also underlined the importance of archives and archival institutions that are hosting all these documents and records as important spaces of memory themselves, where multiple narratives and multiple perspectives can be um, interpreted, understood, interrogated, uh, which are critical in the formation of the country's collective memory in these particular times, as I have anticipated. Now, while the literature has a lot focused on the uses of the archives for to protect human rights, to enable truth, justice, and reparation, and to contribute to the collective memory, I argue that the interconnections between uh, transition justice and archives from a, a conceptual point of view. So the conceptualization of this relationship has not been uh, enough investigated. And for example, uh, what do I mean by these questions related to uh, what factors do contribute to the activation of these archives, how they have been used, why, who activated them, uh, under what circumstances, uh, to what extent, uh, and for how long, are all questions that needs to be uh, much more investigated. The activation of the archives is a concept, it's not a concept of mine. I have borrowed it from uh, one of the major scholars of archive and, and human rights, uh, Eric Ketelar, who actually defines the activation as every interaction, intervention, interrogation, and interpretation by creator, user, and archivist as an activation of the record. Now, I have used the concept of activation in my article, in my research, is slightly different, in a slightly different way, but it's a good concept, it's a good starting point to understand in which ways these archives have been, not only how they have been used, but who has actually allowed, what have been the enabling factors that allow the use of archives to these purposes, to this extent. There's also a temporality connected to the archives and transitional justice relationships, which I think it's important to investigate because over time, um, many sets of these archives like the Human Rights Organization's archives and uh, the Truth Commission's archives or the Temporary Courts archives, while the institutions creating those records are temporary, they leave behind a legacy which has long lasting consequences in the future as I'm gonna show you uh, in this presentation today that's happened in the Chilean case. And so the fact that these archives are used multiple times for different purposes, sometimes also unexpectedly, it's an important factor that I think deserves further um, investigation. This is for what is the general um, um, definitions of transitional justice and archives and why I think it's important to understand interconnections between the two. Before I move to the Chilean case, 
I, which I actually think is one of the uh, best, probably case in point worldwide when we talk about this relationship between transition justice and archives for many reasons. One being that uh, um, in Chile, the transition justice trajectory has been very long. It starts in the 90s and it's still ongoing until today where currently uh, the country is under the process of a constitutional convention, a very innovative process of constitutional convention, uh, which is actually rewriting the constitution drafted under the Pinochet dictatorship that lasted uh, 17 years between 1973 and 1990. So the very long process of transitional justice, many transitional justice mechanisms, as I show you in a minute, have been implemented in Chile. So that's quite a long story to tell. So different truth commissions, trials, uh, memorialization initiatives, reparation programs. So there's quite a lot to investigate in terms of how they have used uh, evidence records previously collected. And thirdly, there is also a long tradition of archiving of Chilean human rights organizations that have actually started to document and collect evidence of the crimes that were being committed in Chile since the early days of the dictatorship. And this has been quite an impressive and monumental work that these organizations have actually done for many years under the dictatorship. Just a quick overlook with a timeline about the long trajectory of transition justice in Chile, because not many people are familiar with everything that has happened in this country. So just to give you a quick overview of when the thing started, started and how many mechanisms have been implemented. So in 1990, we have the uh, start, the transition to democracy when the first democratic elected government um, um, starts, is elected. Sorry. In March 1990, uh, President Elwin establishes, the first democratic elected government establishes a national commission <clears throat> on truth and reconciliation, which is popularly known as the Reti Commission from the name of its president. It lasts by, between 1990, it ends its work in 1991, documenting more than 3,000 victims of forced disappearances and illegal executions or torture resulting in death. So it's, it's a, an, a, an a commission that only deals with the people that have died during the dictatorship. So the major uh, violations is the right to life and personal integrity. The commission continues its work with a follow-up body called National Corporation for Reparation and Reconciliations, which started its work in 1992, ends in 1996. And it's actually uh, this body created soon after the Truth Commission is actually in charge of investigating those cases that have not been previously investigated, um, locating the bodies of the disappeared, and also which, has, which had not been completed as a task by the first Truth Commissions. And it administers a wide range of reparation packages to the victims of human rights violations. In 1998, um, you might uh, remember the arrest of Pinochet in London, which has been quite a critical event, uh, not just for Chile, but worldwide for international law in general. But in Chile, it has got a big impact in the sense that after the arrest of Pinochet, when he is returned back home in Chile, in 2000, a flood of investigation starts and human rights trials will start after the 2000s and they're still ongoing, where hundreds of perpetrators have been um, either prosecuted or convicted and uh, um, they're currently still ongoing. So it's still quite an open chapter that it's still going on despite many years have passed. In 2003, a second truth commission is established, this time dealing with the big victims of torture and political imprisonment. Uh, this commission, it, it ends its work in 2004. It's called the Valich Commission from the name of its president, Valich. And it recognizes uh, um, 30,000 victims of torture and political prisoner. This commission is reopened uh, in later years, ends its work in 2011, and it further recognizes another nearly uh, more than 9,000 people victims of torture. So the story continues. And since 2003, there has been a huge emphasis on symbolic reparations and on memorializations, which is currently an ongoing process. And it has become the new terrain of contestation and negotiation regarding the past in Chile. Um, this is a picture showing the Museum of Memory 
which is the landmark memorization initiatives uh, um, uh, um, created in 2010. And this is a torture center, former torture center from the DINA, the secret agency that committed most of the crimes, which is called Jose Domingo Cañas 1316, which is the address of the former torture centers. As I said, memorization is quite uh, um, a huge process at the moment uh, in Chile, which is happening not only through memory sites, but through archives and through many other forms of cultural artifacts, expressions, and so on. Going back to the, all these mechanisms in Chile, why I've shown you this timeline, because all of these mechanisms, the truth commissions, trials, uh, memory sites, have been possible thanks to the um, abundant, extensive documentation that I was mentioning has been created by uh, a collective of human rights organizations in Chile which have been very active in documenting, preserving, filing, systematizing uh, the um, extent and the magnitude of the abuses committed. When I talk about this, I will mention one specific um, documentation and archive foundation of the Vicariate of Solidarity, which is actually the documentation of the, one of the main human rights organizations in Chile called the Vicariate of Solidarity, which was um, under, which was created by the Catholic Church immediately after the beginning of the dictatorship, uh, which was actually called with another name a few years later. It continued in, six, in 1966 as Vicariate of Solidarity, and uh, um, it was uh, in charge of helping, providing legal and social assistance to the victims of the dictatorship. Uh, it's a quite was a quite big organization, employing hundred people. Uh, working as lawyers, as social assistants, uh, working in the neighborhood uh, with the poverty and so on. So, um, um, and so it, like he conducted quite a huge work in terms of documenting. And this work of documenting is demonstrated by the legacy left behind, which is the documentation, the archive documentation center, where, for example, you can see uh, the, uh, there's a public documentation center. Uh, which contains more than 4,000 titles related to human rights, 4,000 documents printed by the Vicariate and other human rights organizations. The Vicariate was producing weekly, monthly bulletins uh, and channeling all this information abroad uh, so that it could reach international organizations such as Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the Red Cross, which then could use this information to put pressure on international organizations, creating one of the first transitional human rights network uh, during the 70s and 80s. The most important uh, part of the archives left by the Vicariate of Solidarity is constituted by its legal archives, uh, which um, hosts 85,000 documents related to 47,000 cases of people assisted by the lawyers of the Vicariate, either as uh, um, a relative of people that had been detained and then later discovered disappeared, or people that were being um, uh, tortured, people that were detained illegally. All of these people or the relatives went to the vicariate to testify what had happened to them, if they had been tortured, if they had been illegally detained, or the relatives if the family had... Uh... Sorry. The Vicariate contains a magazine and press files um, where there are more than there are thousands of press files classified according to different topics and covering the period from 1973 to present time. And a microfilm center uh, containing a photographic archive and a video library compri comprised of 200 documentaries and movies on human rights. These documents have been extremely important and have been used for the, as evidence for the two truth commissions. So both the first truth commissions and the second truth commissions have availed of this documentation, documenting. That's why the Reti Commission, for example, in only one year, was able to document more than 3,000 cases of human rights violations with such, uh, with utmost accuracy, because most of the information already existed and the Vicariate had shared its archives with the Truth Commissions. And the second Truth Commissions also benefited a lot from the archives of many other human rights organizations. I'm mentioning only the archive of the Vicariate 
because it's considered the largest uh, um, human rights archives in Latin America and possibly worldwide, but many other human rights organizations specializing in, uh, um, um, for example, working with political prisoners or with uh, kids uh, or with the minors uh, um, of the uh, um, children of the detained disappeared or uh, on the psychological effects of torture. So they were specializing on different groups of victims and on different topics. They all produced extensive amount of documentation. There is a guide produced by um, the university, the Alberto Hurtado University, which actually details exactly the content and extents of the um, archival records contained uh, and stored and preserved by each human rights organization in Chile. These documents of the vicariate in particular have been particularly useful uh, for also as evidence in the human rights trials, which I showed you started after 2000 and uh, in the reparations that have been paid to many different types of victims uh, since 1990 until today. Now, while the human rights organizations archives and the Vicariate of Solidarity Archive have been extremely useful to build the archives of the human rights, uh, of the, sorry, of the truth commissions and the transitional justice mechanisms, so too the truth commission have created their own uh, large extent of records forming their own archives. Uh, and so, for example, the RETIG archives contain information taken from the human rights organizations, but also uh, relatives and witness testimonies from 3,400 people uh, that testified, they went to testify again, or victims that had never testified before, and international as well as documentation from international NGOs and other agencies. The truth commissions not just simply inherited this uh, information, but it cross-checked on every single cases with public agencies, with the um, civil registry, with the electoral registry, with uh, police records that could be accessed by the truth commissions, etc. So all this information was cross-checked in very much details, meticulous details. The reason for which this information, these archives have been fundamental to uh, pay the reparations in the immediately after closure of the truth commissions, but in the longer term, this evidence unexpectedly uh, provided uh, one of the most important source of evidence in the trials that started in 2000 and are still ongoing. And I have personally interviewed the judges that used, that continue to use this documentation in their trials, that did it so um, in the early years when the trial started and they're continuing to do so because they believe it's, they have verified that it's very much reliable source of information and it helped them to build the pieces of the puzzles of the um, crimes that have been committed. So it's been extremely helpful. Uh, all judges have said that they use uh, quite a lot this type of information. This information has also been extremely important for the construction of certain memory sites for example, the wall of the disappeared, which is a giant wall in the general cemetery of Santiago containing the names of all the people that had been recognized by the Retic Commission, both those disappeared and those that have been illegally um, executed. So all the persons that have been certified, this information has been extremely helpful for some of the memory um, sites and that have been built in Chile uh, since the early days of the transition. Equally, the Valich uh, commissions have got their archives, two Valich commissions have created their um, extensive archives, uh, which again collect information from the human rights organizations, but also from international um, organizations, foreign embassies, national press and international press, uh, and the survivor testimonies, which in between the two, putting together the two truth commissions, um, it actually puts together 40,000 um, survivor testimonies. The second truth commission deals with the victims of torture. So people were alive and went to tell their story and went to bring their documentation, their certificates that they had been detailed. Because in Chile, all this has been painstakingly um, documented. Being a very bureaucratic dictatorship, everything has left a trace. And this is why we have all this amount of information in these archives. In this circumstances, the truth commission uh, differently from the first truth commissions, had also the possibility to have access uh, from registries of the armed forces 
and detention centers records, information that was not at all available uh, in the first truth commissions where the militaries didn't cooperate at all and didn't give any possible information revealing um, evidence on the crimes committed. In the second uh, truth commissions, because the political context had dramatically changed, uh, some cooperation with the armed forces was possible and the RB um, and some other branches gave uh, the Truth Commission, some uh, the registries of their detention centers and people that had been detained there, so that the Truth Commission could cross check the information provided by the torture survivors with those of um, in the hands of the armed forces and Minister of Defense. These archives have equally been used to pay the reparation to the victims uh, and to memorialization initiatives because the Truth Commissions, the Second Truth Commissions recognizes more than 1,000 centers for uh, used as torture centers. And these have been um, recognized, acknowledged all over the countries from the North to the South. So it's it, the Second Truth Commissions, it adds a wealth of information on former torture centers uh, that were used to that purpose. So in uh, the secret, the, the, the archives of the Second Truth Commissions are secret. Um, a law passed by the parliament put a, um, a 50 years embargo on the archives of the village. And this has sparked uh, a national debate and a very contested debate in Chilean society because this meant that this time, differently from the archives of the first truth commissions, this could not be used in trials. So nobody could have access. They're completely sealed, including to, to courts. And the strong battle has started, activated by survivors groups, civil society organizations, and, uh, uh, and courts, which have engaged in a long process, started in 2004, which is still continuing today, uh, whereby there, has been, there have been many attempts to open the archives of knowledge. And the, the reason is not just, it's become a fundamental process of transparency and of the health, you know, the, the, the health of democratic institutions in Chile, uh, because the society wanted to know and wanted to, to have access to this type of archives, not only to obtain legal justice in courts. So the, despite the fact that these archives have actually provoked, uh, have uh, you, the, the secrecy laws, instead of closing a chapter, have opened quite a longer term um, uh, contestation within different members uh, uh, of Chilean society. In the, at the end of this long-term process, uh, which I uh, detail in my, which I analyze in my article again, um, the, pers the victims, the survivors themselves have obtained the possibility to get access to their own file documenting what has happened to them. Um, and they can bring this file to the courts to open an investigation. It's not enough in the, in the sense that judges don't have access to the first Valage Commission archives, which actually could provide, again, much information on the extent and on the, on the circumstances on, of, of where the crimes were committed and by whom. So it's not enough, but it's like a, a lit, little bit by little, uh, these uh, um, archives made their way to courts uh, in different ways. But again, it's been a very long process that I'm only very quickly uh, summarizing here because it's very, it's very difficult to give a complete picture of this long-term process that has happened uh, um, in Chile. All these archives, both from civil society organizations and from the truth commissions, as was anticipating in the beginning, have had a huge uh, impact on memory. Uh, the Museum of Memory that has been inaugurated in 2010 hosts uh, many of the human rights organizations have donated their archives to the Museum of Memory so that they could be preserved, safe kept and uh, granted access to researchers or anybody from the public that wants to have access to them. And the Truth Commission archives as well have, are currently uh, being held in the Museum of Memory, although the, uh, those that are actually in charge of uh, protecting and preserving them are other organizations. So there is quite a, um, there is a confusion about the archives of truth commissions in Chile 
whereby they are physically located in the Museum of Memory, but the First Truth Commission archives are managed by the Human Rights Program of the Ministry of Interior. The second set of Truth Commission archives are managed by the National Institute of Human Rights, which is a national human rights body, but it's independent from the state. So it's quite uh, um, the, 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 while positively these documents have been used um, to provide justice, reparation, and memory in the country, at the same time, they're not, there's not a uniform approach to their preservation and safekeeping and management, and this causes uh, sometimes uh, a very piecemeal approach to archives and not a uniform approach to their preservation, considering the importance that they have acquired over the longer term. So it's become quite a, a problematic aspect of all this uh, archival documentation existing in Chile. This is a picture of the memorial of, uh, that I was mentioning before, the memorial of those who disappeared or were executed under the dictatorship, which is located in the general cemetery in Santiago. Of all this, uh, and then I would like to conclude with this because I'd like to give you the opportunity to have some questions in the end. Um, it's what, it, what, uh, what I was going back on the uh, connections between all these archives and the use that and how they have been used in transitional justice. I will actually talk about those enabling factors. So my research on Chile has actually found out that the activating factors have been different, uh, varied, and dependent, uh, depending, dependent a lot on the circumstances such as the political context, the motivation of the actors that have uh, used the archives, and on the cooperation of the agencies which were in charge of the archives, which means that uh, both from uh, personnel, from civil society and public agencies um, needs to cooperate in order to activate these archives. And the moments in which these archives have been mostly used has happened in these moments of cooperation between different group of actors who have um, equally, whether used or uh, filed or systematized or organized the archives in a certain way, who have actually facilitated access to the people that were requesting them. For example, I make an example about what I mean by this. The judges that are currently investigating, that were investigating the crimes, had easy access to the Truth Commission archives uh, um, because the um, personnel in charge of the archives at the Human Rights Program in the Ministry of Interior was facilitating uh, access to the judges and had good dispositions, having become an important uh, body to help the prosecution of human rights crimes. So this cooperation helped the use of the archives, but also judges which became active and which became and more willing to prosecute those crimes and had access to these archives. Um, or for example, the, the cooperation that existed between the, in the early years of the transition in a very constrained political context in which Pinochet was still a powerful player, uh, where for example, the, the Vicariate of Solidarity provided, shared all of its archives with the Truth Commissions because there was a climate of trust between the Vicariate of Solidarity or the Chilean Human Rights Commissions and other human rights organizations with Truth Commission itself, partly because two of the members of the Truth Commissions uh, were very close to the human rights community or had worked extensively and knew very well with the human, with the human rights organizations, knew very well the work and uh, the, um, uh, you know, they, were, they know about the verifiability of the documents uh, of these human rights organizations. So all of these presence of certain actors and uh, that facilitated the use and, uh, and, uh, and predisposition of those that used the archives in order to having an active role in wanting to pro promote and protect human rights has been extremely important. Arch archives are not neutral objects uh, as archivists very well know and have actually argued so in the past 30 years. Uh, they need actors to activate them and, uh, and, and they need also a personnel in charge of the archives to have a predisposition to uh, facilitate access, to enable access, and to understand the importance that this type of archives can acquire over the longer term when the institutions that, that created these archives finish their uh, role or they may be, may be disbanded, 
but the archives that they leave behind, it's a strong legacy that can help advance truth, justice, reparations in providing fundamental rights to victims that have suffered the heinous human rights violations of the past. Time in itself, according to my research, is also a factor, a very important enabling factor, as I say, because in many cases, uh, archives have been used in later years uh, for different purposes from what they had been created for. And this is actually also another consideration, as I said at the beginning, temporality to take in consideration because people that had uh, sometimes uh, uh, collected all these documents uh, uh, not necessarily were aware or could foresee how all this documentation could be used in later years. Um, uh, so I uh, used, I had, the, play, I had the, the, the fortune to work with a, a great human rights lawyer in Chile, Roberto Garreton, and he always used to tell me we were collecting this information in the Vicariate of Solidarity, but nobody could have ever imagined that all this information would have been essential to prosecute Pinochet himself one day, or it would have such a huge impact in the longer term to repair uh, victims' rights and to promote uh, collective memory in the future. So all of these uh, enabling factors, I conclude, are pretty much important uh, to activate the archives uh, for and in transitional justice to help the realization of victims' right to truth, to justice, to reparation, but also to help build a collective memory, which actually can be built from a different point of view without uh, um, the, the, the collection in Chile, the, the, the collection of all these uh, uh, groups of archives actually permits the recollection of different perspectives on a very complicated past, which actually benefits a lot the new um, democratic system. I'd like to conclude here uh, because uh, I would love to have uh, to ask uh, if you have, and I'll stop sharing my screen. If you have any questions, please, uh, you can raise your hand or you can write in the chat, um, whatever you, whatever thing you prefer, any feedback, any comment, or if you want to ask anything, uh, very happy to take it. And thanks a lot. I have a very shy public. I, I just uh, will put in the chat uh, the, um, the reference, sorry, to an article which I have written on this, and it's actually contained most of the uh, information that I have just uh, uh, shared with you in the presentation. Kira, please go ahead. I think you are on mute. Yeah, I hopefully unmuted now. Yeah. Hi, th thanks very much for the presentation. Um, when you mentioned the, um, the influence that Pinochet still had up until his arrest, um, were there any noticeable changes or differences in the gathering of the archives or the treatment of the archives between when he still had influence and then when it was sort of lessened or removed? Yeah, good question. Uh, no, there was no difference with the, the difference was that uh, uh, under, you know, when he was still very much powerful in 1998, he steps down as commander in chief of the armed forces but uh, he, he's, he becomes a life senator, so it's still quite powerful and immune from prosecution, by the way, before he's arrested in London. Uh, the thing that changes after 1998 is their political context, which changes dramatically after his arrest and after many other things happen in the country. And so people were less inclined to use all this amount of documentation that existed because the climate, well, the political context was still not uh, enabling. When I say one of the enabling factors is the context. Uh, and so judges, for example, had not been willing to investigate until past 2000, when they finally started to investigate, but victims had continued to claim their files and their complaints since the early days of the 
um, post dictatorship period, the Nabadi, um, you know, except few, with the few exceptions of uh, very few cases, proceeded. Uh, the rest were either closed or suspended or archived. So, and, Nab and everybody was using the amnesty law, which was applicable in Chile at the time. It's only after 2000 that judges started to interpret the amnesty law in a different way, not applying the amnesty law because they were using international human rights law um, in line with international human rights law. But what it changes is the political context, which actually allows judges to use this material that had always existed, but they were not willing to use this evidence because they were not willing to investigate. When they started to investigate, they were actually looking for all the information that uh, uh, existed. So. That's great, thank you. Uh, Beatrice and Michelle, Beatrice. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I have uh, well one slash two question, and I, I, I hope they make sense. So the first one would be how much, and I know it's a very broad question, and I know transitional justice is very much context related, but how much of this Chilean experience can be transferred to other transitional justice experience and uh, contemporary one? <laughs> and um, uh, how much, how important should be the distinction between uh, making it a, a more uh, uh, deep distinction between human rights archives, as you were saying at the beginning, and transitional justice, justice archives can be important for contemporary experiences. I hope this makes sense. Yes, yes, of course, sure. The good question. Chile is one of the cases that offers probably most lessons to contemporary cases, although each case is different because uh, for the peculiarities of every a single context of conflict or of dictatorships. Um, but the, Chile certainly has a huge uh, experience in um, documenting and collecting the archives in a way that it can be used later for um, the protection of victims' rights. So they've always had in mind, without knowing what exactly these archives could be used for, but they've always certainly had in mind justice uh, reparations, truth, and memory. And so the way also archives were collected um, is, was important. And I think that lessons from Chile also come from the fact that uh, because of uh, an archival practice in the country uh, and, this, and, and, and historical predispositions to document everything, um, this has also uh, been another of the, those factors that actually have played a role. But I think that the Chileans uh, have a knowledge and know-how on the um, preservation and management of huge uh, amount of documents. Uh, um, and the way they have systematized it has actually been very helpful for those that have come later to use this documentation. So in this, I think in two things, um, the Chilean um, archival um, documentation process has been quite useful to the current, uh, um, to the current contemporary system, certainly not regarding uh, opening access, which they're still dealing and fighting with, and therefore regarding access, it's not a good case to take as an example. Um, and, uh, and the second question was, uh, uh, yes, on the distinction between, I personally argue uh, in my article that we need to make a distinction between um, archives of NGOs and archives of civil society organizations, whether are NGOs, religious groups, victims, relatives, and archives, of, uh, um, of traditional justice mechanisms uh, for the simple fact that transitional justice mechanisms are uh, generally state-owned, state-supported. And, uh, and so there is a state, non-state uh, ownership of archives and the transitional justice archive for these reasons, for the state, non-state, and also because of the timing, like uh, human rights archives are usually created while the violations are taking place. Um, traditional justice archives are created after the violations haven't taken place. And so there is possibly much more documentation available, possibly also loads of uh, more uh, victims' testimonies uh, and relatives' testimonies, uh, um, survivors' testimonies themselves that's been collected by the transitional justice uh, um, docu um, institutions. And so the two have the two um, sets of archives. They create a huge difference in terms of uh, uh, management, preservation, safekeeping, and, open, and, and, and facilitating access of these archives. Uh, and the state has an obligation to 
facilitate access and also to make this uh, archives available for the realization of right to truth, justice, and memory. So I think that there is a fundamental difference in this case, while the private archives, uh, which are fundamentally and have been shared for the same reasons, but still remain in the hands of uh, non-governmental or private institutions, like, for example, the Vicariate of Solidarity Archives, which is the uh, largest human rights archive in Chile. It's in the hands of the Catholic Church, who own and decide um, about what to open, what not to open, and uh, what to share, what not to share about their archives. That's why I think it's a, a fundamental, there's, there's a fundamental differences between the two sets of archives. Michelle. <clears throat> Hi, Anissa. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. I can. Thanks. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, I'm just interested. Um, could you speak a little bit more on the secrecy laws? Um, I'd like to just understand a bit better. I suppose what's the legal basis for those laws? Um, it, it seems that if you, I suppose, seal an archive for 50 years, it prevents the victims um, real justice in the sense that the time they, they may have passed on by the time that they can get access to the archives. Um, so just to really understand a bit more about that and how you mentioned that the victims in the end got their individual files, but the, but they mightn't have been, um, they didn't give perhaps the broader context um, of, the, of the historic violations. And I was wondering how in the end did they get access to their individual files? What was the the, the arguments that um, in the end they managed to get their files? Yeah, uh, it's a long, it's a long, uh, it's a long story. It's a very long story, but I try to make it short. The secret, the, the 50 years secret laws was simply passed by parliament. There was no discussion about it. Uh, and it was quite, um, I mean, unex unexpected. Um, it, 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 it was passed by the government soon after, by the parliament soon after the, the, um, the Valich report was released on the um, basis of uh, the, the Lagos president at the time said um, on the basis of protecting the confidentiality and the privacy of the survivor testimony. So according to the government, this was made principally to protect the victims and not actually to shield the perpetrators from justice. There was lots of narrative going around the fact that these documents really, that these archives uh, were not really um, naming perpetrators, so they were not really containing information, incriminating evidence for the perpetrators, but was actually mostly a uh, survivor's testimonies, and it was their decision um, whether or not to release the archives. The truth is that nobody asked when the Truth Commission operated. Uh, and people went to testify and bring their documents. Nobody asked uh, the victims, uh, the, the survivors, I call the victims the survivors, nobody asked them, um, what do you want to do with this testimony? Do you want it to be open? Do you want it to be closed? It is true that some survivors had declared, uh, from speaking with people that have worked on the commission, it's true that some survivors uh, have express, expressed uh, their resistance to the publication of, the, of their story, of their testimony, because many survivors had never shared the details of the torture or of their detention, not even with their relatives at home, not even with their closest relatives, had never told the truth in general. So they didn't want this to be shared, which is certainly possible, but the majority of the survival groups have always uh, um, argued that that was not the case. And the reason why they had testified was actually quite the opposite, so that the, the country would know about the truth. And so that this could be the made, make part of the history and the memory of the country, because survivors had actually been quite a lot uh, dismissed from the public debate, from the public arena for many years. So the transition starts in 1990, but they only for the first time recognized in 2003 with the Truth Commission. And the Truth Commission was intended uh, by the government, mainly as a truth reparation uh, package. So trials and justice, legal justice was not um, included in the political agreements of the time. And that was one of the reasons why, uh, according to many survivors, uh, the archives were totally sealed. It was basically meant to impede um, that this documentation could be used. Uh, 
this evidence could be used in the trials. Also because the archives of the retting were widely extensively used uh, as evidence in the trials. And uh, the government feared an invasion and floods of cases because there were 30,000 and then 40,000 cases of torture. So they simply, this was the very uh, pragma pragmatic reasons why they were sealed. How the campaign has happened after that, uh, a collective has actually filed cases to open the archives on the basis of the right to truth and the right to information. And um, for a very, it, it's, a very, very, it's a very complicated legal story, which I'm not going into the details, but I said the end of this is that um, they, uh, the, 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 the survivors have access to their individual files. And even more complicated than this, the second sets of Truth Commission's archives, those operating in 2011, are actually open to judges, but not the first sets of Valich archives, which is even more complicated because it actually gives a different, uh, um, it, it's also like in, in, in human rights terms, it's, it, it's discriminatory because some victims um, have, uh, you know, some, some of the evidence related to certain victims can make their, their way to trial to the courts and others cannot. So there's a lot of inconsistency, which is the negative aspect of the archives in uh, the ways archives are currently handled. All these archives are handled in different hands and they are used differently. And this, this, this should be a much more systematic approach. But the passing, the Michel Bachelet promised uh, to abolish for, for, for uh, uh, forever the, the 50 years to, to eliminate the embargo on the Valet archives, she didn't have, I mean, all, it had the, 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 the proposal didn't prosper in parliament again and was defeated. So they couldn't, uh, the only solution to this is a law that allows uh, the opening of the archives. There's no other way around it. And uh, civil society groups have really done their best uh, to, to do that. I don't know if this clarifies a bit, but it's a very long story. Uh, okay, I don't see any more, if I'm looking, okay, I don't see any more questions coming. Um, so if I don't have any questions, I would actually, or maybe there's one chat, sorry, before I say goodbye. There are questions in the Q&A, sorry about that, I didn't see that. So, um, thanks, Sarah, uh, Shane. Can I ask you if you see a process of increased digital, digitization of archives which should facilitate greater access? Yes, there is a long discussion about it at the moment. Um, uh, it's still, um, the, the Museum of Memory is working a lot on this and it's actually digitizing most of the archives that has received, uh, certainly from the trade unions, from the human rights organizations, not the same thing for the archives of truth commissions because they are not both open to the public. So the, but for the archives that are open to the public, which the Museum of Memory is giving to, to most of them, yes, there is a huge uh, process of digitization and this is giving uh, greater access to the archives, Shane, yes. Elizabeth, good afternoon, interesting presentation. Thank you. I'm wondering in average how many cases are clarified in Chile through the archives and transitional justice. I know Chile has been a pioneer in this field in Latin America. So I would like to know how successful TG has been in this sense. Maybe it's still a question. No, Elizabeth, it's a very relevant question. I argue that transitional justice in Chile uh, was mainly uh, possible, many of the mechanisms, because of the huge evidence that existed. It is a fact that without evidence and without reliable records, you cannot have um, successful and longer term transitional justice mechanism. So the records and the evidence left is quite fundamental. Chileans and Argentinians are um, traveling around the world extensively to show how to document um, uh, and, and collect evidence regarding human rights because they have been pioneer in this field. Um, and and they, the importance of archiving and of collecting this type of documents, um, as I said, with the intention to 
then uh, you know collect these documents for transitional justice uh, um, it cannot be um, I mean overestimated so it has been quite a lot due to work done by Latin American organizations uh, in this sense so it's not a silly question it's a very relevant one I think I've addressed all the Q&A questions and, uh, and, and the live questions as well. So if there are not other questions, then I will thank you all for participating and for listening to this, to this, to this webinar this afternoon. Uh, sorry, apologies. Uh, I had to take a call, which was urgent call. Sorry about that. Thank you for joining us and have a good afternoon.